obviously there were you know there were singles before Matchstick Men. One thing I, I wanted to know is you get a rec you've got a record deal, you can put records out, but these records aren't happening. Is that sort of a glad on one side, fucking very sorry on the other side? Well, yeah, for us, but you see, you, you're seeing from today's perspective, that's how it went in those days. You didn't get a band and think it was going to work tomorrow. Record companies, agents, um, um, uh, publishers. I remember being signed by a guy called Ronnie Scott. He was great. He signed us for uh, writing. He liked my songs. I don't know how he heard them. This is probably Pat Barlow again was fixing something. He says, well, listen to my group. And he signed me a record, um, a publishing deal I got, and then he spoke to John Schroeder, and I still, I would never have had the kind of faith he had in us. He spoke to John Schroeder, who then subsequently got us a record contract. And the first thing we recorded was I Who Have Nothing. We were good at that, Alan and I, taking old songs and messing with them. Because both of us liked certain classical things influences and we both have this thing and, and I was listening to something of his the other night it's just Del Shannon the thing goes on I knew he'd smile when I said that what was we up to just with the records coming out the ones before match yeah so the first one was I who have nothing the second one was a track of Alan Lancaster called Hurdy Gurdy Man which is great and then we did a cover that John Schroeder had got by a band called the Blues Magoos they we knew how to have names in those days, didn't they? And they had a song called We Ain't Got Nothing Yet. And then I wrote a song called Everything Had Gone Into This. Bum, bum. Everybody was doing this for a while. Satisfaction. Everybody. It was, and that, I've noticed over the years that drum patterns changing. And uh, I'd write almost but not quite there. And then Max didn't win out. It was a hit. So we had I Have Nothing, Hurdy Gurdy Man, We Ain't Got Nothing Yet. Almost but not quite there, and then we had the hit. Do, 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 do. Well, I think it's that. My wife loves me telling her that story, but she's nuts. Little house on the prairie, that sort of thing. Yanks are funny. So wasn't it, you just said earlier, wasn't it, that was going to be a bass side, right? What, what was the initial idea that this other song, Gentleman Joe's side, what I don't know. That, again, those are the days that people can't remember. And they, it does seem kind of ancient now, but... Once we got, the, although we were songwriters, or assigned as a songwriter, to, to make records, you'd have to go to publishers, say you went to Denmark Street or wherever, and there was all these publishers, and you'd made an appointment, you'd go in and sit down, and he'd, <laughs> you know, he'd play you something, do you like that? Nah, do you like that? No, we like that one, take that one. We like that one, good. And you, that's how it worked, you know, and you'd go and record them. Um, well, how did I get to that? <laughs> and he's the boss. I don't know. That was the question led in. Um, yeah, just saying about the, the songs that came along at the, and Gentleman Joe. Oh, had they come about? Yeah. So we a bunch of songs, and that was uh, somebody else that John Schroeder suggested this because this, this guy was name was Kenny Young, and he'd written a few hits and stuff. And uh, at that period, I was explaining it to one of my kids this morning. He came down. He's quite well, you know. I'm still muscles tomorrow, you know. And they all look at you as if, and I remember this drummer, some drummer, the first bloke I saw take his trousers off in puff, what the fuck, you know, it's your underpants, what's going on? That, 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 that musos have that, they'll get undressed anywhere, you know, apart from Matthew Letley, gotcha, Matt. And, um, <laughs> where the fuck am I? <laughs> no, I will lace Gentleman it on this. Gentleman Joe, we're going to get there eventually, Joe. so how's that coming about? Right, so then, <laughs> then I think John Schroeder presented us and said, look, we try this song, and because he's had various hits before and he was a real respected writer, and it was, Hey Joe, and you please lend me your ear, I've got to... Fuck it. Um, and we did that, and I think it was John Schroeder who said, well, hang on, right after the record was finally, Match Team Members finished, that must have gone... Makes it man, gentleman Joe. There's no contest, so they turned it and it went out and it just phew, took off. We were really, it was more of the time. And uh, we came back from Butlins, we were a kind of rock band, we did lots of covers. Got back to London, it, he's looking at me like I've drifted again. <laughs> no, no. It, we got back to London and everybody's gone, ride your pony and, the, and all that stuff. So we did some of that to get work. And then we, you know, the time, and I did match it, man. So when we broke, we were a rock band with a soul set and a psychedelic single. I didn't even know what psychedelic meant, and people do keep asking me. I don't know. I was copying things. And so it was lucky that match it, man, or that period died away because 
like people today, you're, I was you're kind of following anything where the success was. That'll do. Because I saw Keith Richard recently mention that back when when he was younger, he, he realised he'd been in the war, and he said, "Oh, it's all going to be great." He said, Everywhere we looked, we had rationing. Everything was black, grey. There was holes in the ground, bomb sites. He's, and he said, "We won," you know. And so everything at that point was to escape the black and white life, this depressed life that England seemed to be. It seemed to escape. You know, if you, if your idea was to make a lot of money, don't be in rock and roll. Make some paper clips or cardboard boxes. But that was the thing at the time. It was to to escape all that what England had been. And is that what you asked me? Well, I, let me get me go this, let me go this next bit because this is interesting. You were kind of going out there anyway. I've mm. got this theory that status quo never looked that comfortable in their psychedelic get up and this, that, and the other. And no, well, we I were taking thought... places to wear that stuff. It was just everybody was doing it. You know, London was like that. If you didn't dress like that, you were out. You weren't. So you would. We would kind of been mods, me and Anna Lancaster, and Rick too, I think, and. Um, it was it was associated with the Beatles that whole period, which was donkeys, not the Beatles. And um, there was this place in the, in Carnaby Street called Carnaby Cavern, and there was this guy with what we call a shock of red hair, who um, you'd always see dancing on top of the pops. Hang on a minute, something going on here. And so the entire industry went to his shop. So you'd be doing a photo session or something like this. When well, I remember doing this fucking. And it's this yellow shirt with these huge dewdrop fucking things, you know. And I come out and it, la, 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 here we go. <coughs> That'll do. Uh, you can't wear that, mate. What? You can't wear that. I did that with Jimmy last week. Shit. Go and get another shirt out. Oh, great. Lovely. No, I did that with Amen Corny. Fuck it. Um, and that's what it is. Everybody been to the same shop. So, so the, uh, with the post matched it men thing, as soon as, as soon as Maximin was a hit, various people were put to us to help us out. And as soon as you were losing that, they were all gone. That's the next band then, you know, and you were left to your own devices. And spinning forward somewhat, we played Castle in Tooting, and it was the first night I think we were supporting Meet the Hootball, Hop the Himmit, that group. And um, I remember thinking we were going to go on in whatever we wore, like as you walked into, that's what we're going on, that's what we are, you know. I remember thinking someone's got to come out and tell you off. You were, we were st still already that indoctrinated in the showbiz. Somebody would tell you off. I kept thinking we're going to get in trouble, but they didn't, and it meant we could wear what we like to, and It sounds ridiculous now, but at the time it was fabulous. And it's also weird that the again people don't realise you could not get in the cinema in denims. You could definitely couldn't go to a restaurant. You would not be allowed to go to fucking work in gen denims. So the fact that we broke that denim thing. Everything turned out to be denim shoes, skirts, waistcoats. The idea of that in the in the sixties uh, and going anywhere. So you, when you look back and see people wearing and think it's funny, well, it's like them pants hanging out now. They're going to be funny. Your ass hanging out. Believe me. <laughs> 